Hi everyone, many of you don't know me. My name is Carl John Fechner and I've been around for a while, as you can see by my, by my persona, is that many years ago, we co-led um, Intercessors for Melbourne and uh, created intercessory prayer groups in every municipality in, in Melbourne, Victoria. And then also we led intercessors, our intercessory prayer team in our church, which was a church of about 1,500 people. And also we had done or completed a five-day course with Lila Tahoon, who was from probably people know Brownsville AOG at Pensacola, where there was a massive outpouring of God's spirit. So we sat under her teaching to learn how to pray and intercede for a city, etc. So um, I've just been asked recently in these cur current um, difficult times, how to pray and take our cities back. So this is what this teaching is about how to pray and take our cities back. So I just want to share screen. So just let me set this up for you. And uh, just do just a couple of things. Okay, so you should now see a blank screen there. So I just need to do something else here. All right, so how to pray and take our cities back. So the first thing that we need to do is get on our knees and pray. And this is the only way that we will get our cities back. And 2 Chronicles 14 says this, and many of you know this, but it's really important that we really get a good understanding of, of, of what this Bible verse really says. So let's look at it. It says, then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. So there's a few important parts about this. If my people who are called by my name, so if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. So that's our job there. If we do that, what happens is God saying, I will hear, hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land is our land ever had a time when it needs restoring yes well it certainly does right at this stage and then 2 chronicles 7 14 7 15 sorry says my eyes will be open and my ears will be attentive to every prayer made in this place so what a great promise that god has has and that's the starting point is 2 chronicles 7 14 is the part the mistake that i've seen a lot of times with this uh, people have taken this and i've seen it with you know different groups is what they will do is they'll take this verse and then they'll pray for five seconds so to speak or five minutes on repentance and the rest of the time in their prayer time let's say the other 90 percent is petitioning god and telling god what he should do and the bottom line is god wants to see the land heal God wants to be able to restore mankind to him. So really, in, a, in essence, what's happened is that we've got to back the front. We should have 90 minutes humbling ourselves and praying and ask God's forgiveness for the sins and five minutes asking him what he's done. So let's go. So that's the premises of it. So God is and has many titles. He's a righteous judge over all things. And Hebrews 12, 23 says, you have come to the assembly of God's firstborn children, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to, to God himself, who is the judge over all things. Who has come to, you have come to the spirits of the rightness ones in heaven, who have now been made perfect. The point I want to get across here is God has many names, but the one that I want to emphasize in here, and it will start to make sense, is that he is a righteous judge and he is the judge of all things. And this is important to understand from 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we have a judge in heaven who is judging us and the actions and, and, and deeds that uh, uh, people do on earth. All right, so uh, in judge, here it is. It's a judge, a magistrate of God passing judgment on one ma on man, an arbitrator, to decree very important to understand this part about god 
The next step is Psalm 50 verse 6 says the heavens revealed his justice for God himself is the judge and interlude. And that's the international ISV version. The next thing is Psalm 94 2 says, Arise, O judge of the earth, give the proud what they deserve. Hear that? Judge of the earth and give the proud what they deserve. Psalm 75 7, you are the one who judges. You can take away power and give it to others. Now, this is a really important part. Catch these Bible verses and understand what's taking place in the heavenlies you are the one who judges you can take away power and give it to others now that's what we want to happen on earth we want the power taken away from the kingdom of darkness and given it to others which is us so at the moment it's the other way around we need to reverse the curse so to speak on what's happening so um sure fat um uh, is here is to pronounce sentence to govern, execute judgment, to act as lawgiver, pronounce sentence for or against, and by implication, to vindicate or punish. Okay, so out of those verses, this is the important part to understand is a strong concordance movement behind, uh, uh, behind that, the implication behind that. All right, so the next thing is, where does God judge from? Well, it's the courts of heaven. So let's have a look at this with the courts of heaven. And it's a lot of times as Christians, we simply miss this and don't understand that. So who attends the courts of heaven? So in Job 1.6, it says this. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser, Satan, came with them. This is a verse that not many, a lot of Christians don't understand or don't realize that Satan comes to the courts of heaven. And the same thing there came to present themselves before the Lord and the accuser Satan come with them. This is an important part of having victory when we're praying to take our cities back and understanding intercession and how, how the courts of heaven are a very important part of that. All right, so Job 2.1, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came along, uh, Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. That's the King James Version. So pretty evident Satan's going to the courts of heaven to present himself before the court. Zechariah 3.1, then the angel showed me Jeshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. The accuser, Satan, was there at the angel's right hand, making accusations against Joshua. So there it is. What's happening is that he, the Satan, is petitioning in the courts of heaven. And this is a real clue and a real key on how we take our cities back. And that's what I'm going to show you in this teaching. Okay, so the next part is, who does Satan accuse? Us, mankind made in the image of God. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Revelation 12, 10b, for the accuser of our brethren, he who keeps bringing before our God charges against them day and night has been cast out. Now, the important part is this scripture is in used in lots of ways, but let's have a look at it. The accuser of our brethren keeps bringing charges before our God, our God day and night. He's in the courts of heaven coming against us, petitioning. And so let's have a look at accuser or Satan. Is a, as you can see, it's a strong wording there. It's a complainant at law, specifically Satan, to charge someone with some offense before a judge. How's that? So he's there in the courts of heaven bringing charges against us. You know, not just us as the Christians, 
but against humanity in general. Most people do not realize that is the case. All right, so what charges? Uh, so let me just have a look. So how do we, oh, it's, it's got all the verses that skip. How do we overcome Satan's accusations? Revelations 12, 11 says, and they overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they love not, and they love not their lives unto death. So the word there is logos, account, that is answer or explanation in reference to judgment. Testimony there, evidence given judicially or generally what one testifies testimony before a judge. So how do we overcome them? Repentance, corporate and individual. That's how we overcome it. And that's what I'm about to show you. And, but it's important that you understand these parts of it. So Hebrews 4.16 says, look at this. It says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So come boldly literally means without reservation, with frankness, with full and open speech. What a great promise. God wants us to come to his throne of grace. God wants us to come to his courts in heaven so we can receive mercy. He will find grace to help us when we need it most. And if there's ever a time in history, we need it now. So we can, have thrown, we can approach a throne of grace, not of judgment, obtaining mercy for the past and grace for the present and future. Psalm 89 verse 14 says, Righteousness, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. He is a righteous judge and a just and merciful God. So the old Aussie way, not sure who's listening to that, but in Australia, we've got a expression, wink, wink, nudge, right, nudge, nudge. She'll be right, mate. Away you go. That simply won't work. We can't do that. We can't. God is not a God that can bend the rules. He's an absolute God, but he's a merciful God. So we can't just ignore sin. We just can't ignore the things that are happening around and wink, wink, nudge, nudge. She'll be right, mate. Away you go simply won't work very important to understand because satan has legal rights against us and satan has legal rights against us that's not just the church that's not just the individual that is in society over the all what it is i mean society in general in western society has gone i don't need god well, if I don't need God, that leaves it open for the kingdom of darkness and Satan. So it gives him legal rights to come against us. And of course, he's in the courts of heaven, justifying the, the things that he's doing on earth through some of the despots and, uh, and troublemakers, etc., that we see happening on earth. Okay, so some important things. Um, um, is, uh, is to understand shouting and screaming at satan won't work that mindset is flawed and that's what's been happening in ecclesia in the church is that we think shouting and screaming at him will make it work and somehow or other it will magically go away that mindset is flawed and the evidence is in history of the mess that the world is in that simply is not working so we must get off the battlefield and first operate in the courts of heaven and understand that Satan has legal rights against us individually and corporately. And so we come back to 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, that is the courtrooms, and will forgive their sins and restore their land. And again, to Chronicles 7, 15, my eyes will be open and my ears are tentative to every prayer made in this place. Now we can have that by definition made in this place in the courtrooms of heaven. It's important that we can overlay 
these verses into that realm as well. Not down on the ground, but in the courts of heaven. Okay, so the seven mountain mandate for people that don't understand, and this is really important to understand this mandate that God has given to his ecclesia. So in 1975, Bill Bright, who was the founder and leader of Campus Crusade for Christ, and Lauren Cunningham, who was the YWAM founder or Youth with a Mission, were both given a dream and a vision. And what happened is the vision was the seven mountains of society or influence. And the interesting thing is, what I neglected to mention, is that Bill Bright and Lauren Cunningham were about to meet. And just within days or whatever, before they met, God spoke to them and gave them the, the, the vision of the seven mountains of influence and the seven mountain mandate, and they were to share it with each other. So this is what it is. So the seven mountains of influence in society, God was showing them is religion, family, education, government, business, media, and arts and entertainment. That's the seven mountains of, of um, the seven mountain mandate or the seven mountains, the seven major mountains of influence that influence a society. So the seven mountain mandate was largely ignored by the church. They didn't do anything with it. It didn't go any further. So what happens, it was largely ignored. And the common mistake has been is the, the mountain of religion effectively should be operating in the fivefold ministry, equipping the saints so that they go back into their mountain of influence, whether it be family, education, government, business media or, or arts and entertainment, that the mountain of religion should be discipling them to go back into their mountain and they control that mountain. And that unfortunately has been largely, well, it's been ignored. That's not largely, it's just been ignored by the, by the church. And, and what's meant is that the mindset has been that we'll pull them out of their mountain of influence and we will bring them into the mountain of religious religion and ignore the other mountains. Now, the important part about this is the church ignored it, but Satan didn't. He heard that vision and that mandate. And as a result, those mountains are controlled by his despots and the woke culture. And we've got a world that is a, in a, <laughs> use that expression, it's a world of pain. It's out of control. And the reason is his despots, his people, that are being influenced by Satan and his cronies, they're now in those mountains of influence. And when it was our mandate, we were meant to be the influencers of those seven mountains. Now, the good news is that in recent years, God is speaking to his ecclesia, which is the correct uh, terminology for the church. We think church, we think buildings. But if you look at the word ecclesia, it has two meanings to it ecclesia means a gathering of fellow believers with a common beliefs but the most important part when you study the terminology ecclesia it was a governing body and we as the church or the ecclesia are meant to be the governing body and the governing influence in those seven mountains not the other way around the good news is that a guy called John Enlow, you can look him up. I've read his books, wrote a book called The Seven Mountain Prophecy and expanded on the vision that uh, Bill Bright and Lauren Honey Cunningham were given. And also he's written another book called The Seven Mountain Mandate. So if you really want to understand the seven mountain mandate that God give us, they're two excellent books. You can buy them in paperback or you can get them in uh, Kindle quite cheaply. I've read both. They're just fantastic books. And it clearly shows the mandate that God is asking us to do. And this all ties in with how to pray and take our cities back. Lance Walner is another guy, just a fantastic guy to listen to and follow. He's spoken extensively on this. And as he says, when he got the revelations of this, he felt like he was out in the wilderness. Nobody was wanting to listen. You know, he just felt like, well, hang on, this is what God's given me, but nobody's listening. But now it's starting to get caught on. And Bill Heyman 
and you can Google. He's got he's got excellent books on the seven mountain mandate and also on what God's about to do on earth. He's got some really great books on that. That's Bill Heyman. And there's many others that are that are speaking about this with the seven mountains. So the, the ecclesia is starting to wake up and address this issue and know that it's core to what we must do when we pray and take our cities back. Okay. The results of corporate sin in your city and region. Luke eleven twenty one says, Satan's belongings, and, I, and the italics is my words, Satan's belongings are undisturbed as he stands guard over his fortress, uh, uh, over his fortress kingdom, strong and fully armed with an arsenal of many weapons. So let's just go back on that so you can see what's happened there. Satan's belongings is, is people. He absolutely hates mankind because we're made in the image of God and he will do whatever he can to destroy mankind. And he does that through people who inflict evilness on other people. He guards his fortress and kingdom. So that's your city and region. And that's not just your city. That's a global thing. But if we break it down into uh, regions and cities, and this is about taking your city back and you know, praying and taking your city or region back, because you as the ecclesia have been given authority in your city and region. And that's what I want to teach you. Now, he's strong and fully armed with an arsenal of many weapons, which is collective sins. Now, this is a bit subjective, what I'm about to share with you. And, uh, and you know, a bit hard to quantify, um, but just trust me. Uh, well, just, you know, you choose what I'm about to say with it. But we, were, we live in, in Victoria, which has got a, um, you know, very dictatorial, dictatorial leader with communist Marxist as his values. And also he's announced that we as a state of Victoria, Australia, uh, we're a secular state in his, in his eyes. He's pronounced that. So he's the person that we put in to manage the mountain of government. So we were traveling to the airport to, to go on a seven day holiday. And as we traveled through, and I went past what's now known as Essendon Fields, uh, and it's where it's, it's now owned by the uh, uh, Lynn Fox Group, but it was the old original airport. And as we were traveling through, it's like God opened my eyes and I saw in the spiritual realm this spirit that was the ruling spirit over that area. And this spirit was a big, fat, 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 grossly overweight, fat spirit. And as I was praying through, and you can work out what that, who, who was that spirit was ruling over, but what I saw, it was the collective sins, Satan's stronghold and his arsenal of weapons is the collective sins. So that fat spirit uh, was fat as a result of the collective sins of the people. That's how he operates. So repentance removes his legal rights. And that's what we're about to talk about. And that's where I'm heading with this is how we're praying. We're going to pray and repent of those sins. So let, look at the next verse of what it says. So Luke eleven twenty two, 22, and here's the promise. But when one stronger than he comes to attack and overpower him, the stronger one will empty his the arsenal, and that's the repentance of your city's sins in which he trusted. The conqueror will ransack his kingdom and distribute all the spoils of victory. Now, you need to catch this verse, what it is. But when one stronger, and technically speaking, that is us, we are the stronger one. And like the Bible verse, which is quoted many times, greater is he than it is me than is of the world. But also understanding when you take that, and greater is he is the Holy Spirit that's in us, the Spirit of God, but then is of the world, and the world is Satan. But what's taking place when you read this verse and the previous one, it is a sin that's making Satan strong 
and his, his demons strong in the city. But when we come and attack and empty his arsenal, which is repenting of the sins of your city in which he trusted, the conqueror, us, will ransack his kingdom and distribute all the spoils of, the, of victory. And what it is, and effectively, and I'll just take one more there, is that remove the blindfolds of unbelief and set the people free. So let me just unpack that a bit. The God of this age blinds the mind of the unbelievers that they don't see. So he is strong. Satan is strong and these demons are strong because of the corporate sin. As we repent of that sin, we're taking away uh, his arsenal. His arsenal. His what he's taken to the courts of heaven and saying to God, I got a legal right to be here. I got a legal right to come against these people. But as we corporately repent, we're removing those sins that he's holding in the courts of heaven. By doing that, we will ransack his kingdom. And that's what it is. The repentance will do that and distribute all the spoils of victory. The spoils of victory is fellow man that the truth will set them free, that our prayers will remove the blindfolds of unbelief and set the people free. Very important to understand this principle of what's happening. So let's have a look at Zechariah 2 Chronicles 4.4. 4. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't realize that was there. Uh, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see their glorious light of the good news now as fellow believers i mean you know, and i was 42 before i became a christian so i was in the world and satan the god of this world had blinded my mind and you know it's like the, the song amazing grace i was blind but now i see so i know what it's like you know to be a non-believer to not understand and not see it because my mind was blinded now on the other side of the fence i'm going but can't you understand it i mean who would ever want to be in the kingdom of darkness after you've tasted the joy of living in God's kingdom, the kingdom of light? Okay, our mandate. Our mandate is this. We state our case before the courts of heaven. So Isaiah 43, 26 says this. Let us review the situation together and you can present your case to prove your innocence. Now that's God speaking. Let us review the situation together and you can present your case to prove your innocence. The next verse is Isaiah 43, 24b. It says this, you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your faults. So do you think God is sitting in the courts of heaven and he's happy to see the sin of what's happening of the people on earth and Satan bringing all these legal rights against humanity? His God's most precious possession is mankind so he is burdened with the sins and wearied with the faults and the sin that people are doing so what was what must we do act 319 says it now you must repent and turn back to god so that your sins will re be removed and so that times of refreshing will stream from the lord's presence what a great promise repent turn back to god sins will be removed refreshing will stream from the lord's presence what a great promise and god will respond and it says this in isaiah 43 25 i yes i alone will blot out your sin for my own sake and will never think of them again what a great promise if we get on our face and and corporately repent of the things that we have done so let's have a look at corporate repentance and nehemiah is the one that the holy spirit kept talking to me about and then i went to do a study on it and this was amazing with what i saw is nehemiah stood on the in the gap on behalf of the people and it's amazing how it unfolded and a lot of prayers mature christians or intercessors or prayers will understand the terminology stood in the gap so what happens is we need to stand in the gap on behalf of the people who the God of this age 
has blinded. Plus, repent for the corporate sins of the church and repent of our own individual sins. So Nehemiah 1.4 says this, When I heard this, I sat down and, and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah 1.5 says, Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Ne uh, Nehemiah 1.6 Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. And you could have your city region in, in replace. So for your people in my city region, I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. So it's pretty close, uh, evident of what is to take place in there, what he's doing. And that's 2 Chronicles 7.14. So this includes repenting of generational sins of our ancestors. And Exodus 34, 7 says this, I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive inequity, rebellion and sin, but I do not excuse the guilty. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected even children in the third and fourth generation. Now, it's worse than that because what it means is that if in, in four generations, if someone has not repented and broken that inequity, it just continues down the family line. And that's what we found with deliverance ministry and generational sin, that this is it really important to understand that, that we have to not just confess the sins for us that are alive now, but for what our ancestors did. And some of that's going to make sense shortly. Okay, so like Nehemiah, you're standing in the gap as we're repenting on behalf of the people in your city and region, which you as the Ecclesia have been given authority over. Okay, so overcome the over outcome of Nehemiah's prayer or your prayers. Others help rebuild the walls. So your prayers will stir up others into action. And that's happening in my city now. I'm just starting to meet. We, we, we just prayed through what I'm about to show you. And, and then already we're starting to feel, see an open heaven. A couple of people have come to salvation. And as I'm talking to the pastors in the city, they're starting to embrace and see what's happening and wanting to be stirred into action. So it's created an ever open heaven over our city, and that's what it's going to do for your city or region. The people, general population were convicted. Now I'm trying to back to Nehemiah. That's still to outwork itself in our, in our region. But this is what happened when you read the first part of Nehemiah and the next part. They were rebuilding the walls. Others were stirred to help him in what he was doing. So then... So then what happens is, and I'll just put one more verse. So what happened is that the, as the people were convicted. They can, can uh, confess their individual sins. And in Nehemiah 9, 1, and this is a New Living Translation, it says, on October the 31st, wouldn't that be great if that's happened in our nation? And today is the 5th of October, 2021. The people assembled again. And this time they fasted and dressed in burlap and sprinkled dust on their heads. And those of Israelite descendant separated themselves from all foreigners as they confessed their own sins and the sins of their ancestors. They remained standing in the place for three hours while the book of the law of their God, their God was read out aloud to them. Then for three more hours, they confessed their sin and worship the Lord their God. And it's interesting when you read the book of Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah when, <laughs> when you read the book of Nehemiah, you can see how it unfolded. Like Nehemiah confessed, he got others around him, they started to rebuild a wall and were stirred into action. The people convicted, the populate, the general population was convicted. They confessed their individual city or their, uh, confessed their individual sins 
and that city and or whatever it was was restored and it was just amazing when you read and if you've got a study bible you'll just see he just changed the whole environment it's just a great great encouragement on how to pray and take our cities back all right so prayer strategy so prayer strategy is get into groups of four and five and you can do this many different ways you might have a zoom zoom meetings and or you might and then break into chat rooms or you might have it where you break into groups but you'll see this will make sense why you break it down you just don't want big groups of 10s and 20s and 30s and if you do have that you need to break it down into individual groups of four or five people and as i said this will make sense in a minute so you repent of the sins of each mountain in your city region authority so those so seven mountains and i'll come back to those in a in a minute so you you repent of the sins on each mountain so you break it into the mountains so it's deep holy spirit led repentance for each mountain so you pray it out until no more holy spirit reminders that's not very good english but the terminology and i think everyone gets it if you're a, a mature prayer is you just pray it through and what happens is let me just see or just understand this is that what's taking place is when you're in the group of four or five people you each pray for that mountain and repent for that mountain you collectively and individually pray through that mountain and it's amazing we've just done this and it's amazing what happens is that you get each one of you gets something different from the holy spirit on what to on how to pray it out and remember satan is a legalist and so where can the confessing the sins removes his legal rights from that mountain and so don't leave the mountain till everyone in that small group has prayed through the mountain now it's not a sprint it's a marathon so leave no stone unturned and this is the amazing part is you will find that this will take you up to an hour per mountain this is about deep repentance prayer for the sins of what's happening no no just little five minute mickey mouse prayers this is a deep repentance accepting responsibility standing in the gap praying for that mountain and, and you do it on each each mountain and stay focused on the mountain don't deviate from the mountain so don't deviate onto other mountains don't deviate in other things stay focused on the mountain that you're praying over the mountain of influence like if it's you know government stay focused on the mountain and repent of the sins of the government in your region this is not praying for australia this is not praying for the world this is praying for your region and what's happening in government in local government or the political arena within your local region so please understand that because that's the authority that god has given you and it will really make sense and really bite in you remove the the sins the corporate sins on your mountain all right so the prayer strategy um, continued this is not a bless us time or telling god to take action it's important to understand god desires that all men turn to salvation we know that right so it's no shouting at the devil or binding and loosing mindsets that's not what this is about this is about going to the courtrooms standing in the gap and repenting of the corporate sins so again then if my people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways the corporate sins of your city or your region not australia not victoria unless you actually clearly mandated for that or the world or whatever this is for your region we're bringing it right down into cities and regions how to take it back because understand you are the ecclesia 
You are the government of God in your city. And that's a real mind shift, uh, um, mind shift in a lot of people's understandings. We are the government of God. We are the ecclesia. And we should be enforcing what happens in our mountains. And, that, 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 and I'll unfold a bit more of that in a minute. And so just recap. It's not a blesses time. Oh, God blesses whatever. No, it's not that. It's not telling God to take action because he wants to take action. That's been there, done that. That's common mistake that's happening. No shouting at the devil because he's not deaf. No binding and loosing because that clearly, I know what the Bible is saying on this, but in this season of time, we have to get on our face and humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. The blessing comes at the end of when we have done all of these things. Amen? Okay. So then again, my eyes will be open and my ears will attend it to every pair made in this place. This is what God wants us to do is pray and corporate and remove the legal rights that have been operating in the courts of heaven. Okay. It's all about repentance. Hope everybody's getting this because this is the only way that it will work. Okay, so how do we do this? So, so that so now we're actually you understand that, and we're ready, and we're going to get into the courts of heaven, and we're going to start praying. So the first thing that we need to do, and we always did this with heading up intercession, and we sprinkle thanksgiving and and praise and worship right through the whole day. Uh, when it, with it. And the, it was actually quite interesting. The first time I was introduced to intercessors for Melbourne, and I went as a guest, and it was from um, nine o'clock in the morning till three thirty, four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I'm a prayer. I love prayer, but I'm going, man, alive, that's a long time to pray. You know what? With this methodology and what they applied, it went in a heartbeat. It just went so fast. And that's what you will find with this when you're praying this way and you're being led with the Holy Spirit and on how you're doing it and what you're actually repenting for. So Psalm 100 verse 2 in the Passion Translation, as you serve him, be glad and worship him. Sing your way into his presence with joy. So we're singing our way into the courts of heaven, effectively. Psalm 104 uh, says this, you can pass through his open gates with the password of praise, come right into his presence with thanksgiving, come bring your thank offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. What a great promise. Psalm 100 verse 5, for the Lord is always good and re ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you, so kind that it will astound you. And he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone who knows our God can be trusted for he keeps his promise to every generation. So what a great understanding of entering his gates with thanksgiving. So the other part is come with a clean heart. So Matthew 6, 14 says, if, and Jesus saying, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. Uh, if, but if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Okay, so it's just important to understand that as you come into a time of prayer, that just understand, like just checking in with God, God is anything that I've done. You might be coming into this meeting and you just had an argument with your your spouse or, or, you know, or you've abused someone on the road or whatever, understand we're coming into the courts of heaven. So you want to come with a clean heart. Don't get bound up with it, but come with a clean heart and make sure that there's nothing there. The next thing is the types of worship. And we've like YouTube these days is just a fantastic vehicle. I've subscribed to YouTube, so I don't have to have any videos. And with a bit of mucking around, I mean, I'm going to show you some of the songs that I've collected together and used. But effectively, what you're doing is you're creating an atmosphere of repentance and deep sorrow. And really, it's getting into a place of 25 to 30 minutes. Just get into worship. 
So let me see if I can find this for you. Okay. So that should be now popped up on your screen. So this, uh, uh, I've just made a, a compilation of, of, of songs and you can see it's 89 videos and you can see how many views. I don't know if they're all mine, but I've certainly, you know, this is just, this is my place of worship. And so this is a great song, uh, just that it's a good song to listen to. I think it's for the future, but look at some of these with this, like I repent. So it, it creates an atmosphere of I repent because that's what I'm doing. And this with Robin Green, a great um, um, Indigenous pastor in, and singer in our nation of Australia. This is just a beautiful song of the consuming fire. And then this one here, Render Heavens. Uh, this guy is amazing. He's busking out on the streets of Dublin. But it's just a great song. And, a, you know, just, just, just matches. You know, I find with worship, I get the worship. And as I said, there's 89 videos in here songs that i've just put together so it depends on the situation we're in of what i would do but these are the songs because this is about repentance and so we want to be in a place of repentance and have that mindset so you know this is a promise render heavens and then this here you know pr um, prayer for healing our land so they're the songs that that i use and there's a whole bunch of others here let it rain and wave maker etc so they're basically the songs so create a song that can give you intimate worship with God with the focus on repentance, okay? All right, so our next one in here, so let me just come back. So, um, okay, so hopefully this should work. Okay, so this is a bit out of, I'm just a bit out of sequence, but I'll show you something here. So this is the thing that we do is record your repentance prayers. So this is one sheet that I've just given your image and it's all squiggly and probably a bit hard to read. It was my writing. And so we put in the center education. So what I did is I had a, a portable whiteboard and had butcher's paper with it, you know, the sheets that you could just fold over. So this is when we were prayed for the mountain of education. We just put a circle in the middle and then away we started to pray as we were praying, you know, things like godly, godless teaching, atheism, dens inequity, you know, removing the Bible, you know, Satanism, witchcraft, and all the woke agendas that is there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these were the thing, uh, the prayers that we felt that it was. Drugs is there, etc., skewed boundaries, prom promiscuity, promoting disrespect the safe school programs. These are all the things that we sense the Holy Spirit was doing. So as we were praying and, and we prayed, there was three of us together and we prayed and we kept praying through it. And then we'd pray it and I'd make a note for each one that we prayed, just one of the notes that you can see there. So we did this for each mountain until we felt the Holy Spirit had given us everything that we needed to repent for. And also buried in that, or we might see it on the page somewhere, is that it was also the generations beforehand. So in our area, in our city, from the time that it was founded uh, in Eastern Victoria, Australia, so we repented for the sins of this city from the founding fathers, et cetera, et cetera, right, right down to that. So that gives you an idea what we did for each mountain. And as I said, on average, it took about one hour to do that. It was really unknown territory for us for how long it took. But I know as we now, as we prayed over the seven mountains that we did that, we lined up a Saturday morning thinking that, yeah, yeah, we'd pray it through. But as God got hold of us and kept showing the things, we hit about two o'clock and realized that we had other things that we had to do. So we then, well, God help us put it on hold. So then we went away, we prayed another uh, on another evening and then we prayed out on a Saturday. And then I'll show you the other things we did and took action on that Saturday shortly. Okay, so as you pray over each mountain, stay on the mountain until it's prayed out, which is what I said. And then what happens if you, if you find you're getting weary, just stop and get back into worship. That's what we did when the first meeting and what we did as a matter of course with intercessors for Melbourne. We would pray as the Holy Spirit was leading us 
and in the case of this is you know we're praying for the mountains as the holy spirit leads us is that we would just stop and have worship and just come back and you know fill ourselves up again with praise and and worship but it's a very very powerful way of praying and man alive if we adopted this in every region and city in our nation and took it to the nations in this methodology we would transform and create open heavens this sort of stuff has not been done on a concentrated level and we need to start doing this, this is where it starts prayer on our knees praying for the sins over those seven mountains okay so the conclusion so after we prayed over those seven mountains um, we we took communion and between the, the you know three of us and took communion as, a, as like a symbol of sealing it and what Jesus has done for us. And then in our town, we have a, and our, our city is, is Bansdale, Eastern Victoria. And so, and there's a rotunda in the city, in the, in the middle of the city. So we went there and we blew the chauffeur. We also, that's, sorry, I forgot to say, that's where we took communion. We went down to the center of our city and took communion together. And then we blew the chauffeur as an act of war. Now, we actually had a show, an actual chauffeur and one of the ladies um, uh, blew that and it's an act of war, but you can get that on, on YouTube. If you can just go into YouTube. I mean, YouTube has got everything in a good and bad, unfortunately, but fortunately it's got good stuff. So you can get in and find that one for an act of war. And this is interesting. In Numbers 10, 9, I went to have a look at some of the things. This blowing a chauffeur can represent many, many things. But in Numbers 10, 9, in this verse, it says, when you arrive in your own land and go to war against your enemies who attack you, sound the alarm with trumpets, then your Lord, the God, your God, will remember you and rescue you from your enemies. Hallelujah, Jesus. What a great, great promise. And then Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And if that was ever needed now, it is in our nation. It's on a global level with what's happening. I'm not sure when you watch this, but right in October, 2021, it's really intensified in the woke culture and in the demonic attack that's on us. And as God's people, we need to get on our faces and repent and remove the legal rights that the enemy is holding in the courts of heaven. Okay, so pray and decree his purposes. So after you've prayed and what you've done, and when you've done those is understand God has a dream, a plan and a purpose for everybody. So this is now the blessed time. So when you have totally prayed over every one of the seven mountains and totally repented of everything that the Holy Spirit has said to you, corporately and individually because you might be convicted of some stuff for yourself is that when you do that now is the time to come to this part but do not skip that first part because this part will be a waste of time if you haven't done the other part so pray and decree his purposes god has a dream and a plan and a purpose for everyone in your city so as pray his dream, his plan, his desires for everyone in your region. And that's very simple. You can just do that. Lord, I just pray your blessings on everyone. I pray that your dreams, your plans will be fulfilled. Your desires for everyone that's in our city. I pray that your dreams and plans and purposes, that's the blessing that you're praying for them. And then this was a prayer that I sensed that the Holy Spirit had shown me at some stage earlier. And it was a prayer that he showed me to pray over Victoria as it, as it is. But it's in the name, and so it says this, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I decree and declare, and you put in your town and region um, and its people, be upheld in the arms of Jesus Christ, that the Lord God be the father of the people of your region and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, be the source of all truth, when making daily decisions for the betterment of mankind and the people of your region. So I just think that's a great, great prayer to conclude with. So let me just hopefully, 
the sharing has um, stopped. So I hope that is uh, helpful. Uh, the website, my own website is growingdeeperstrong.com. And as you can see behind me, we've we spent six years and some 35,000 hours writing a course for new Christians. And on our website, we can teach you how to create your own new Christian training center. Because the fruit of this, remember, is meant to be the spoils and the spoils is his people. And I have a feeling that we are, which either happened when you've read this or it's very, very close that the, the prophets are saying in Amos 3, 7, the Lord is saying that the, it says the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And the prophetic voice collectively across the globe and also I know from my own dreams and visions that I've been getting is God's about to pour his spirit out on a massive way and thousands are going to get swept and it's really millions are going to get swept into the kingdom of God. And when that happens, they need to be discipled. And that's what we grow, wrote Growing Deep and Strong for. But I have a feeling what I've just taught you today on how to pray and take your cities back for God is a, is a key point in doing this and allowing God to move. It'll come out of repentance. And this is, I believe, is a way to accelerate that in your region. So God bless you. I hope that's helped you. Looking forward to chatting with you. Message me. This is going to be on YouTube and on our website, etc. So if you like what you see or need some help in this, just email me. The email address is on the website. So God bless you. Have a great day. Trust you've enjoyed this. Catch ya. Bye.